Amazing. Hello, everybody. Hello, if you're watching on Livestorm. Hello, if you're watching on Facebook, on YouTube, on LinkedIn. We are worldwide, global, amazing. <laughs> Welcome, uh, and thank you so much for joining us today on this Botecchio and Octavo Systems webinar. Um, so today is all about custom embedded Linux systems made easy. Um, obviously, we've got two esteemed speakers here. We're going to talk more about that. Um, I'm Georgie. I'm the head of content and the marketing team lead for Wotechio. I'm here to take your questions. No matter what platform you're on, I can see them and I'm going to take them at the end. So please do ask if you want anything you know, answered that isn't clear during the webinar and we will answer them all at the end. And also moving on quickly. Uh, the agenda, obviously we're going to talk about the benefits of using a system in package for embedded processing, the importance of software development, you know, custom customization needs, best practices, long-term maintenance, and obviously how Octavo and Tefio can work together to make sure that you can create embedded Linux systems that last, which is exactly why we're here. I am going to pass it over to Adrian. Uh, from Wateke, our US Solutions Director to introduce himself, and then he'll pass you on to Raj, and then we'll get started. So enjoy everyone and ask questions away. I will see you later. Thank you, Georgie. Um, yeah, hi everybody. My name is Adrian. I'm the Solution Director in our Seattle office. And most of my work now is essentially understanding what our customer and OEMs uh, want to do from a software solution perspective trying to find the right team, the right approach, communicating and organizing all that internally. So a mix of engineering and making sure that we deliver what you need and that we find the right solution. And Niraj, to you. Um, hello everyone, I am Niraj Dantu. Uh, I'm an applications engineer for Octavo Systems. Uh, we are experts in designing and manufacture of system and package devices. In my role, uh, I support customers online and offline, and I also work on reference designs and software we release to support our devices. So before we talk about system and package, um, let's take a look at some of the challenges that uh, companies are facing when it comes to embedded design. Um, they are being forced to add more features to their product, uh, in terms of networking, in terms of storage, in terms of computing power, in terms of AI at the edge. Um, adding these features requires them to do increasingly complex designs uh, with higher power envelopes and next-gen memory technologies. Um, as we have seen in the past three years, dealing with disruptions in supply chain is a real challenge, whether you're developing your product or uh, producing the product in high volumes. These challenges become even bigger uh, when we add other variables like shorter development timelines and smaller hardware and software teams. So we at Octavo believe that we can help meet these challenges. Um, so who's Octavo Systems, first of all? Uh, we are leaders in system and package technology. We have a team of experienced systems and IC engineers. Our goal is to make embedded design easy for everyone. Uh, we take advantage of cutting edge manufacturing process, our expertise and strong industry relationships uh, to deliver products and support that make adopting new technology as easy as possible. Our system and package products offer many benefits from design through production that make adopting technology easier. And our high, our, and our industry leading sales and technical support will help you get across the finish line, uh, putting your product into production. So advantages of, of system and package. Before we talk about the advantages, let's, let's talk about what a system and package is. Um, this slide shows the history of semiconductor integration from uh, the invention of the transistor all the way through to the SOC, which is a uh, integration of complex subsystems on a single piece of silicon. 
Over the past decade, though, we are seeing heterogeneous integration being used more extensively to drive computing growth. Um, heterogeneous integration, when done at the highest levels, is system and package. The reason we need system and package slash heterogeneous integration is because of the divergence in semiconductor manufacturing processes uh, for different application. It used to be that all subsystems, including analog, power, RF, memory, processor, etc., were all integrated into a single piece of silicon. We can no longer continue to do that uh, without significant costs or implications to the overall design. Silicon processes uh, now differ based on power dissipation, clock frequency, voltage, transistor density, uh, you know, based on factors like you know, cost effectiveness, efficiency, and uh, complexity of the design. System and package allows these processes to coexist uh, while still furthering Moore's law and driving integration. So how does system and package drive integration, right? Um, the answer is by utilizing packaging level manufacturing techniques for system level manufacturing. This slide shows an example process flow of manufacturing of a system and package. Uh, on the left, uh, the silicon dice are obtained from one or more silicon manufacturers. Uh, they are cut up, attached, and wire bonded to a substrate. This substrate can be uh, made of normal FR4 type material, uh, but with micron level uh, design rules allowing for tight integration and, and routing. Passives and packaged components can also be integrated in a surface mounting step. Finally, uh, the substrate is molded over and balls are attached at the bottom, resulting in a device that looks like a chip, but really is a system. So here's an example of this manufacturing process in action. We have uh, the processor, the power management, LDO and EEPROM dice, all of them wire bonded to the substrate. We also have packaged DDR memory and passives of different sizes. All of this uh, put together, all of these components illustrate the point that uh, it is a component by construction, but a system by design. Another point of observation here is that these components are required for most systems utilizing a microprocessor, such as the one seen here. So now that we have introduced system and package, let's talk about the advantages of using system and package in your design. One obvious and very significant advantage of using system and package is the design simplification that comes with it. Here's an example of a design that needs a microprocessor for an application. So it requires an elaborate power management scheme to power the SOC, uh, a complex DDR memory interfacing, as well as non-volatile memory for root file system and kernel storage. These are table stakes when it comes to embedded Linux system such as this. So what do I mean by table stakes, right? For example, uh, getting the DDR to work does not differentiate the product, right? But it is required for all microprocessor based designs. This is how the same system would look like when using system and package to integrate the table stakes. It simplifies the design to a great extent. This design requires a single power rail input and even provides power outputs that can power the rest of the board, eliminates more than 100 components from the bomb, simplifying the supply chain significantly, 
completely eliminates the most complex part of the design, which is the DDR, allows the team to focus right away on the parts of the design that differentiate it from the rest of the market. And as a result, eliminates up to nine months of engineering time uh, spent developing the system. So along with simplification uh, comes size reduction. System and package can reduce the size of the end product significantly, allowing for bigger batteries or or reduced size of the product. SIP, in fact, is the obvious choice when the goal is smallest size achievable. To illustrate the space savings, here's an example uh, that shows a star 64% reduction in the size of the layout when a SIP is used. System and package is not just about simplification of the design. It also optimizes uh, the customer end product in, in several ways. Octavo SIPs have a wide ball grid array pitch that allows for single layer routing with access to all the IO of the processor. More than that, uh, the IO are intelligently organized to not just escape, but lay out the whole board on a single-sided PCB. This allows for low-cost, reduced layer count PCBs to be used for end products. And compared to something like system-on modules, which are currently used extensively in the industry, no special connectors or no special handling procedures are required for SIP. The example layout here showcases these optimization advantages. An obvious result of uh, the above mentioned design simplifications and optimizations is cost savings. So here are the main factors that drive the cost of the ownership of, this, of the design down. Engineering costs are reduced due to reduction in time and effort spent on the design. PCB costs are also reduced because of low cost, low layer count PCBs that are smaller in size. Assembly costs are reduced because SIP replaces over a hundred components on the board and also resulting in faster assembly times. Time and effort spent on managing the supply chain for hundreds of components is also greatly reduced. In addition to all of this, the cost of the end of life of a device is also reduced as Octavo as a SIP vendor is able to manage that for you. Adding it all up, uh, the cost of ownership of designing and manufacturing of a product comes at a faster pace and at a lower cost. A bonus advantage of system and package is the reliability that comes with using it. SIP either eliminates or significantly reduces the risk of product failure mechanisms, such as passive cracking and SMT solar joint failure. The result of this is higher yield and a more reliable product uh, with lower rate of field failures for the customers. So to conclude the discussion on the advantage of system and package, here's a slide that summarizes uh, the benefits. What you get is super fast design cycles, low cost PCB and assembly, supply chain simplification, better yield and reliability, and smallest design possible. Personally, my favorite thing about system and package is again, customers get to think about what is going to differentiate their product instead of spending time and expertise on the table stakes. Here's a look at Octavo's current product portfolio. We currently have three product families spread across three different silicon vendors serving a wide range of applications and processing needs. 
all of these are uh, standard off-the-shelf components that can be purchased through distribution channels. Here are a couple of projects that showcase uh, the Octavo's system and package devices and their advantages we just talked about. On the left, we have the OSD 335X CSIP based edge computing platform. This is a four centimeter by 3.5 centimeter board, uh, single sided with Wi Fi and sensors, with about 10 line items on the, on the bill of materials, it can run embedded Linux, analyze data from the, from the sensors on board and report to a centralized server. On the right, we have a dead bug Linux computer, about 10 resistors, four LEDs and one micro USB port are free wired into OSD 3358 CSIP, which means there is no PCB. You can connect to it and develop via a web server that is hosted through the USB interface. These projects really demonstrate how easy it is to work with Octavo system and package devices uh, and the advantages of choosing system and package for your products. Now I pass it on to Adrian to discuss the software side of things. Thank you very much, Niraj. Uh, so yeah, we're going to switch on the software side, and there we're going to look at roughly these three areas, the role of software engineering and when you're building a new platform, some of the best practices, and how to approach long-term maintenance. So starting with a quick introduction of who we are. So Itokyo has been in the industry for about 20 years now. So building embedded system, uh, focusing on the software on these, on these devices working mainly with OEMs. We have three offices in the world, in the US, in Europe, about 180 people. And then we have all the cloud, we're working with the, the cloud platform that you're used to. We have a number of technology partners, ranging from the Linux Foundation to Yocto to Qt, that help us bring these platforms to life and help our customer help you build those platforms. And at a glance, if we look at the different things that we do, that ranges, as we see in the center, from focusing on the DOS itself, the drivers, the bring up, secure button, things like that, the application and all the UI, and integration with the cloud and the cloud services. And some of the use cases for that are just in general consulting, so workshops to help you find the right solution, so like solution design, system design, optimization, so we're talking boot time, power migrating from one OS to another, or one framework to another, end-to-end -end development when you need software development support on your whole platform. So that can be mobile application, cloud integration. Um, and the two last ones are security, which is pretty key and we do very frequently nowadays, for example, secure boots and focusing on secure boots is, is a key element that uh, we do a key feature that we develop. And connectivity in general, so connecting to the cloud, as well as locally using BLE Wi-Fi and all these different uh, technology stack. Moving on to that first part, which is software and engineering. The way I see it and the way I'd like to highlight it today is as a software engineer, you're here during that phase to really enable the hardware and enable the user experience that you're trying to build. So while the hardware is being designed, you have a very key step, which is that hardware selection, that review process, where as a software engineer, you are helping to make sure that those choices that are being made will make your job easier. So we're talking driver support, we're talking maturity of the components and the driver themselves, compatibility. Looking at whether you can enable the targeted user experience with these components and with this system, so the protocols that you need and the right versions, performance, et cetera. The difference in comparison with the reference platform, that will be key to make sure that you have as little to do as possible in that, in that case, that, that's a good thing. Usually that's a good thing, right? And looking at the boot process, how that's gonna impact it, the different interfaces available, the bandwidth of those and the latency. And thinking as well, a big long-term, once that first validation review has been done, regarding, okay, what's our security approach? What about 
system update troubleshooting maintenance. What will your team and you have to do during the next year, but also in the next five years, which gives a different perspective. And you can also see that thinking, putting yourself in the boots of different people in the team. So as an end user, as a tester, what will you need as a field technician, security auditors, and all these different roles. So trying to project you and make sure that all those are covered from the get-go, because that'll make your life easier. The second step is once you have that platform defined, putting it together. So the bring up is the, the first phase that you do. Obviously, you have your first hardware prototype. You're trying to make sure that this prototype is working, that all the components and everything is working as it should. So it's a lot of troubleshooting collaboration with your electrical engineering team on that hardware revision and probably, most likely, work on a new one, usually the first one. Usually it's hard to make it to, to have it right there for the first time. So at least the second version of the hardware is required. Uh, but you might be lucky. After the bring up, you have the customization of your system. So working on typically like your boot splash screen that you can customize, working on the boot time optimization, obviously supporting all your peripherals and libraries and, and make sure all those work, enabling the right hardware acceleration for your application and for the software that's running and making sure you have the right packages and, and the right support for OTA security, power management, and those things that you probably define in that previous step. But also putting yourself in these the boots of these different people, looking at how you can make it easy to build and test, because that will save you and everybody time. Looking at manufacturing tools, because eventually you'll be provisioning that in factories. So you want to set probably the serial number, the X509 of your devices, doing some tests. So how, again, you can support that and why the T-provisioning I mentioned, to make sure that when your device connects to the cloud, it is recognized as a genuine device and is authenticated. With that, we're going to move into some best practices for these steps. So as you get started, definitely prefer, just as Niras mentioned, to start with a SIP, for example. It's going to save you a lot of time because you're going to, you're going to already have all that platform, that base platform running and focusing on just your custom peripherals and that integration. Otherwise, a bring up from scratch takes a long time. And except if you really need to customize these, these pieces, it's just work that's not going to bring value to your product. So reuse a SIP. That's going to be, that's going to make your life a lot easier. Start from just a, a known starter kit dev board and one that's going to be as close as possible to your final platform, because that's going to be really the environment that you will get familiar with to build and to enable your prototype and your real hardware. So the closer to said you say you stay to that, the closer to you stay from a hardware perspective and also a software perspective, the easier it's going to be. Um, and I mentioned here, yeah, just get familiar with the device and the environment because that's that's going to be what you're going to use in your next step. During your first revision of that hardware, assuming you're starting from that starter kit, for example, and that your the the design is just evolving slightly from that original one, um, some recommendation include if you can keeping the UART and default UART the same, because one of the most scary or tricky part of that first bring up is going to be, OK, is my platform booting and can I make it boot? And if you have the same UART, if you have the same bootloader and base kernel, if you can at least some, see something happening on the, on the serial pool that you have, now you know that the platform is booting and you have some reassurance you can build up of that. It's a lot harder when you don't have anything happening and you don't have any sign whether the platform is alive or not, and you have to try to debug that without that feedback request. So keeping the default to out would be one recommendation. Using jumper, resistors, and test point, wherever it makes sense, because again, you will want to make sure to essentially test the different signals that are happening in your, in your board as you're debugging to see what's happening. If you have those, you can just plug a scope and see what the signal looks like and if it makes sense. As I mentioned, staying closer, as close as possible to the reference bootloader kernel and driver because those can take a very long time to, to 
debug and travel to all the customers if you have a different platform. So the closer you stay, ideally the same for the bootloader and the base kernel, the better. Obviously, prefer LTS distribution from a maintenance standpoint, makes a lot of sense. And for all the modification that you do to the kernel, bootloader, and the system, make sure to track those separately so that when you upgrade those components, you can easily reapply that without having to figure out what you changed and what the difference was. So there's different ways to do that. If you're using Yocto, for example, you can use a set of patch. Uh, you can create your custom recipe that modify those and just reapply that for a new version of the kernel, for example. If we want to go a bit further, uh, it's great to allow easy flashing, of course. It's good in general to reduce your development cycle. So being able to use your SD card, for example, pretty standard, to boot from the network. So using NFS would, again, accelerate uh, your boot. Using things like the Wix image, there are tons of ways to just accelerate the development cycle when you're working on the, on the device. Making sure you have also images and, and tools to facilitate debugging. So you typically have one image, system image, that's for debug, one for development, for example, for your application team, one for production, test, and you can just have these different variants existing. And from a debug standpoint, then you can use GDBS trait. Uh, you can also use your JTAG and have all that bundled in a debug image when you need to have it. Create your own customization layer. Um, and I'd especially recommend it to be able to reuse as much as possible, whether you have different platforms uh, or maybe different configuration, like different screens, and you want to reuse some of that configuration. If you have your custom meta layer with this customization tier, it's much easier to reapply to a system rather than trying to use BB appends or patch that you manually apply to those and, and generalize it. So in general, separating your changes will make it a lot easier to read. Enabling continuous integration, so building, deploying, running tests. Um, Yocto is great for that. You can have those running on your network and having shared uh, cache, network cache, and build artifacts. You can use things like GitLab, even GitHub and others, to have a local runner in your on-premise. That will essentially build the Octo, store that somewhere, and flash it to a vault. And then you can run tests on your platform. And if you find any issue with the reference platform, you can, of course, report that. You can mainline it. That would be also awesome. And just contribute in general. And with that, switching to the long-term maintenance and, and trying to summarize a bit what's key here. So obviously, you need an upgrade solution. There's no system today, I believe, that can survive in the wild if you don't have a way to update it. It might be only local if you can't have the device connected. It might be over the air, might be both. Uh, but that's something that you need to have into plan for. For that, you can use Rock, you can use OS3, you can use Mender, SW updates. There are a number of open source solutions, open source slash of the shelf solutions you can use to enable that in your system. The minimum would be to support upgrading your kernel and components on your file system. Obviously, your application being the one that's going to move the most frequently with the highest frequency. Um, it's also great to have the possibility to update U-Boot because if you find a problem in your bootloader, if there is something there and you can't update it, it's usually pretty tricky. It means that you have to well, have someone go to the device in person, plug a USB stick or do something, and that can be pretty blocking. So if you have already a way to update U-Boot, you're saving yourself some troubles potentially in the long run. And enabling CV checks. So there's ways to do that through Yocto, and that's just using the public list of CV checks that exists. So the recommended approach for that is to start in a few bullet points. One, stay ahead of end of life to our components. So that applies to hardware, but usually the software components are the one that expire, if we can say the soonest. So if, we're, if you're working with a non-LTS version of, for example, Yocto, you want to make sure to know when this one will start being updated and have a plan to migrate to a new version. 
So having that in your calendar, having that in your checklist to make sure that when that happens, you already have a plan, you already took the right steps. Tagging your source um, of, so basically all your components, so um, you boot the kernel, your application, and making sure that when you generate a build, this is a reproducible build, is also pretty key because when there's a problem, you want to be able to go back to that version, not only to binary version that you should store, but to the sole version and be able to rebuild it. So that's done by tagging and Yocto also provides some, a, a great way and they have some um, uh, guarantees in terms of reproducible yields for that specifically. Having a CI, CD, mostly CI, and the, the use for that is just making sure that you can test things automatically to save you some time and also to report any issues that you have directly. And that's pretty key when you add that to the CVs and the fact that you're going to have CVs, you're, you're going to have vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities are going to evolve over time. You want to be able to track that. You want to be able to patch the one that matter to you and get a quick feedback on whether you are doing any breaking new features that you have uh, in your platform. So having that full pipeline of tagging, CI, CVEs enable you to have essentially a, a good environment to build and build efficiently and stay ahead of those things. And keeping the big picture in mind, what I mean here is when you're doing all of that, most likely you will have either today or in the future of the platforms in mind. So the more you can develop in a way that is reusable, the better it is. It can be a bit tricky with Yocto. I, as I mentioned, it's mainly you know, like essentially separating your own changes and making sure they live separately from the base platform. But when you do that, essentially drastically reduce the effort because you're gonna have already your custom layer with your custom application, maybe settings for the system, and you can just reapply that to a, distri a different distribution, a different machine without having to redo from scratch. And with that, I think it's the end of that quick overview. Uh, one way we're doing it uh, at Witecho, we have, so there are, there are a couple of different open source tools. We found the need to develop one uh, that we call CV scan to essentially ease the tracking of these CVs and make sure that, again, the team's team stays efficient and that we're, uh, only focusing on the difference from one to another. And the way this works is essentially you have your source storage with CVA and annotation, which is, for example, my application has these characteristics, this version, and is using these components. This is being pulled by Yocto and Center. And Yocto includes CV scans, which reports for all your software build material, the CVs that may apply, SPDX, which is used for simply tracking your packages in general. And CV scans that you have here at the bottom is used to essentially have you look only at the diff between one build to another. So if two weeks from now you restart that same process, you want to see only the CVs that change because most of the time during the first pass, you'll see, I don't know, for example, 100 CVs out of those maybe only 20 are interesting and you want to tag the ones that are not. And CV scan takes care of that so that between one build to another, you only see the data and you focus on that. And then uh, Black Duck is great for essentially looking at your build material and the status of everything. Uh, JFrog for storing artifacts and Puma that we use for autom automated testing on the development platform will let you just automate all the testing. And those are just like one license and then you get the full source code of those tools for you to customize and maintain as you wish. Some next steps, and maybe Niraj also will have some recommendation, uh, identifying the best SIP for your product and that board. Uh, there are different ones that, uh, that Octavo provides, uh, but hopefully you, you saw that there's definitely a big advantage in having a SIP because of the small fa form factor, the reducing the work on the engineering side, on the software engineering side, because you have all those components integrated. And it's just an easy way to get you started and to focus on what matters. 
Um, the solution is something we can help with. We can have various discussion. I'm sure you have also tons of ideas. In terms of integration, Yaraj, I don't th I don't know if there's anything you want to mention or how to integrate your SIP into your hardware. I think you demonstrated some of that already. And it seems pretty easy to me. I'm not an hardware engineer, though, so I, <laughs> I don't want to say it looks a lot easier. Uh, and then the fi finding the right software partner to implement those or implementing those internally uh, if you have the resources uh, to create all the all that all that software stack from as we discussed. So manufacturing, tests, developing new software itself, connectivity, and and maintaining that long term. And then a summary of what we do. I'll give you um, on your edge. Um, on the Octavo side, um, we offer freely available information and support materials for our system and package devices. Uh, we give you complete data sheets, detailed application notes, uh, open source reference designs, both in Altium and Eagle. Uh, we also provide uh, support through various channels and offer design review services as needed. Uh, with all the resources, customers are able to quickly prototype, uh, develop software, and get to a custom design uh, that works for them as fast as possible. Awesome. On the Wittikia side. Uh, yeah, and on our side, so that's what we mentioned. So our expertise is on embedded system. We work a lot with embedded Linux. That's basically the key technology that we're using, and a lot as well and working on the application and all the software stack. Agile, we're working in a time material Agile collaboration, I guess is how we would say. So there's that collaboration, time material, and working in an Agile way so that we can provide uh, deliveries all around the, the journey and have constant feedback. Uh, delivering and having people happy customers, that's, that's also part of the goal for sure. And we have different accelerators. Chemia, which we use on the cloud side as a way to kickstart the, the connectivity, have things like device authentication, user management, data, and persistent information about your device all available because typically what you need for IoT devices. Pluma for embedded tests, which we developed because uh, we didn't see again a perfect solution, a user-friendly solution for developing tests uh, on embedded devices and CV scan that we use for CV tracking and same thing, save time for development. Amazing. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, are we done with this slide? I'm not going to interrupt you. Yep, I, I definitely don't know second. Amazing. So now we get to thank you both of you, first of all, for your presentations. They were great. Um, a couple of questions in the, the chat. Um, a few people asking, are you going to get the recording? Are you going to get the slides? Yes, you are. I'll put you out of your misery. misery. If you've um, registered to the event, then you will get um, the slides sent to you as well as a link for the recording. If you haven't, don't worry. Obviously, it's on YouTube, the recording. If you want the slides, just um, drop us a link or register for the event. Afterwards, I can send you the slides as well. Um, so we've had a few questions from around. So we've got some on LinkedIn. I can see people, hello. And we've got some obviously in the chat here. Um, so the first one I'm gonna to go to is talking about uh, a, on LinkedIn, Ahmed wants to know, if you generate a generic device tree for the SAP, or if you make, uh, if you make it, you bring up special requirements, essentially. I'm muted. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? <laughs> Do you want me to repeat? Uh, the question yeah. is, I want, to, I want to know if you generate a generic de device tree for the SOP or if you make uh, if you need one for specific special requirements. You would, you would. So you're going to have a part of the device tree is going to be generic in the sense that the, the closer you stick to that, to that base platform, the more you're going to 
will be used in terms of device tree. So you want to, you're going to have all the device trees of the base platform for the processor, for the base platform for the zip. There is definitely a part that is custom uh, for, uh, I mean, you could potentially work around it, but you're most likely going to have a part of the device tree that's going to be custom because of the, device, the different device and peripherals that you're going to plug into your boards and, and what you want to have. So maybe, I don't know, it's going to be 80%. Well, that number might not be the right one, but uh, let's say maybe 80% of the, the device tree being there and then, and then part of it being custom based on the device that you are going to connect to the board. Okay. Anything to add to that, Naraj? No, um, I think as Adrian said, uh, SIP has this advantage of locking down the the table stakes hardware, as you can, uh, as you can say. So, uh, for example, all the PMIC uh, device tree nodes and the DDR device tree nodes and the configuration uh, for all these nodes are 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 now fixed, and you can just copy paste that into your uh, board device tree and get started from there. Okay, great. And if you're anything like me, guys, all I remember now is 80%, which Adrian's like, I don't know if it's 80%, but that's all my mind is going. So. <laughs> um, okay, another question we have, uh, tests on the target as part of you know, constant integration, constant development. Is there a best practice of how to implement this? Tests are part of the special test images, uh, tests are running on the host. So what's the best way to, to do that? There, uh... We we could probably have a separate webinar just for that, but <laughs> um, so yeah, you have different tools. Um, Linux Yocto is providing. So you have you have tools that are going to be provided by Yocto. Yocto provides p tests, which are automated tests that you can run on the platform itself on the device for the different packages and uh, and components that you have. You have LTP, which is Linux test uh, project, yes, uh, which lets you run automated kernel tests for your platform as well. They run on your device. Um, and then you can write custom tests in whatever language you prefer. Uh, and for that, for example, like at Retecure, we use Puma, just like you have a YAML, and you can run commands and verify, oh, if I run this command, this should be the output. It's typically run on the device most of the time. You could run it on uh, on QMU, but it's going to be. You could also run it in QMU, but usually we run it on the device if we have that device available. And the way to deploy that is if we take GitLab as an example. GitLab is going to have a runner, or you're going to push, let's say, a, a reason for request. Um, GitLab builds your image, so you have the CI that you create to just invoke Bitbake and uh, build your image. And then you can have a step which you run on your local runner. So it's essentially something that you run on a computer or something that you have uh, on your premise that is connected via, for example, uh, Ethernet to your platform or serial, either number. And, and once you're in that context of that local runner, you essentially say, well, here is I flash my platform. So you have your command to flash your platform and run the test directly on it. So part of it would be building it, and then you can have a local runner to run comments on your device. And that would be basically a computer that you set up somewhere that is connected to an actual platform to flash and to run tests over SSH, for example, if that makes sense. I can see why you said it could be a whole webinar within itself. It's yeah, sorry. Huge... <laughs> no, 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 be sorry, it's good. Detail is always good. Um, Naraj, I've got one for you, obviously. Uh, do you plan to release uh, SAP on uh, SIP based on the SDM 32 MP2. Lots of words there. Uh, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk, but we are working on uh, uh, roadmap products with ST, obviously. Um, they're working on their roadmap, uh, and we are partners. Uh, we work closely, uh, and we have. Uh, access in terms of hardware and software with the team in there. Uh, so the answer that I would give you is um, we are working with SD on, on other products, not just the MP1. 
Oh, that was a good one. That was a, <laughs> that was a teaser there, I feel. Okay, um, another question. Uh, SIP can be saving by reducing packaging costs of individual ICs, but what about how to manage single source? Um, when it comes to when it comes to single source, I guess I mean so uh, it's the way that you look at when you are uh, you know using a particular silicon provider, right? If you're going with TI, you're kind of locked into their hardware as well. So um, on Tevo side, we have multiple products available, multiple families. So I think the way that you manage it is by working with Octavo and you know having a wider portfolio of our product supporting uh, multiple packages and stuff like that you know uh, when it comes to yakto and stuff like that the, these days you know you can run you can transfer uh, uh, software from one platform to another without uh, much difficulty. I'm saying quotes because sometimes it cannot it cannot uh, be that simple. But um, yeah, just uh, paying attention to how you construct your hardware and software is, I think, a main component of uh, of managing uh, you know supply chain. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of questions which I'm just going to address, but we're not going to ask. So things about pricing or things about specifics with your business. What we'll do is we'll get the experts to, to, to email you directly, just so it's it's you know off offline. It's a bit more a bit more private. We'll keep it like that. But yes, absolutely, we will answer those questions. So don't worry, guys. Um, another question: Any recommendations for a production team for first load? How to make the production pipeline independent of vendor tools to burn empty board? So how so the the tools that you could use to be independent okay and to be independent of vendor tools um, you would probably be able to use um, most of the 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 for example um, one way that you can um, flash a platform to that's imp implemented at U boot level and well supported is a uh, fast boot for flashing so you could probably rely if your goal is to just have only that tool for flashing uh, you could probably rely just on the fast boot i think though it might i think it might be tricky because you're looking at flashing you're also looking at things like burning burning fuses for secure boot if you want to make sure that only your image can boot um and i don't know that that all of that could be done with generic tools without redeveloping those custom uh without redeveloping those custom periods um so if you have if the question is if you have a product more like a range of products and you want to reuse the same tool that's definitely possible it might be some effort but it's definitely possible using fastboot for one side on one side using uh, like a custom tool for burning fuses uh, and this kind of things. And you'll just have to make sure that those platforms well, are all compatible with what you're trying to do. And they're all out of factory have a base image that's going to support it. Uh, I'm not sure that fully answers the question. Okay. If, 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 you, um, if, if you need to adapt it slightly if there's something that you're trying to ask and we haven't answered it then please do because it could just be the way that we're interpreting the question obviously it's different than if you're having a conversation with someone um okay so another question does sip savings can sip savings be reduced by running cpu with features not requested such as displays not used for a device without a ui um does SIP saving can be reduced by running CPU features not required? Oh, yeah. So uh, most of the times, for example, when we're talking about uh, the MT1 product from ST, we do provide uh, a range of uh, tiers of product, uh, which include different features. Uh, I think we have uh, the 153 
C as well as all the way to the 157F. Um, so uh, any all the devices that we have in that family are are replaceable, which means you can upgrade or downgrade without changing your hardware. Okay. Um, a question for Adrian, and maybe you can answer in one word, but I'm sure we won't. <laughs> Do you provide support for Yocto only or Debian as well? Yeah, we work. So the the. Um... Octavo team has BSPs, different BSPs for different platform, uh, Yocto, Debian, uh, depending on which one. On our side, so from a service standpoint, uh, we definitely work with Debian as well. Yocto is a de facto industry standard, but we also have customers who are running Debian on their platform, and for example, on the Red platform, the, the MP run ran that uh, that was telling is also running a DBN and that's one we work on. Uh, so we also we definitely work on DBN as well. Yeah. Lovely. Um, a question from LinkedIn over here. I want to know if the SIP supports AOSP ASUP uh, for Android developer. There's lots of acronyms here. AOSP. I want to know if the SIP supports AOSP for Android developer. I am unsure about uh, about that. I'm not sure what AOSP means, but I think uh, if I have to answer a question about Android, I think um, all the software that ST provides uh, to run on their development platforms uh, can also be used on platforms that have the system package as well. Okay. If, again, if there's something more specific, please write it. Um, and if we don't get to your question, because we've only got a few minutes left, um, anything burning, you can send us an email, um, and we will we will answer them as we as we get to them. <laughs> because there's lots of people today, which is great. Um, and oh, Android Open Source Project. Someone's put it in here. So it's the, there you go. Am I saying it? ASOP A O S P? Maybe I don't know. I see. I see. I think ST has their own uh, uh, Android supporting distribution for 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 their uh, family of microprocessors. I think, yeah, that when it comes to that, that is supported. Okay. Well, we learned something today. It's the Android Open Source Project. There we go. Okay. Amazing. Um, let's ask another one. Uh, OTA. So OVR updates can support Delta update, not full update all the time. Uh, so the question, can we support Delta update? Yeah, yeah. So there are different ways to support Delta updates. It's a bit more involving, oof, well, it's slightly more involving because you need, well, it's a Delta. So you need to have the Delta for the different versions that you have. Um, some tools provide support for that natively. For others, you just have to keep an image, a version of the image yourself stored manually and apply that, patch that. There are different ways to do it. Uh, so either it's inter inter integrated in a tool that you use, the OTA tool that you use, or that can be added onto that. Okay. Okay, guys. Well, we have questions coming, I can see, but at some point we do have to end it. Um, and a lot of them to do with where to source things, pricing, getting in touch with our projects. As I said, our experts and our, our teams in general will get back in touch with you very shortly. So I'd like to thank you all very much for being here today. Thank you all for your questions, everybody online, on Livestorm, on YouTube, etc. Thank you. And thank you to our speakers. Thank you for preparing the slides and teaching us more about SIP and Linux and how to make it easy. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye. Okay, have a great day, everybody. And feel free to get in touch and we'll all reach out to you soon with the slides and the recording. So thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.